Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you to this PRL colloquium, the first one in the year 2021. Uh, this year, uh, you know, I take this opportunity to uh, wish you all a very happy and uh, definitely better year than the past one. The first, this, the first speaker uh, of this uh, colloquium is uh, the director of Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Professor Ravi Nanjundaya. Uh, he's an excellent speaker, a very fine orator and a very lucid uh, you know, explainer that we'll see in a few moments. I also take this to uh, welcome uh, the colleagues from IITM who may be joining through this web link. To make a formal introduction of the speaker, I will now request uh, Professor S. Ramachandran, my colleague, to please uh, do the honors and uh, conduct the proceedings. Ramachandran, please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Padam Raju. Uh, dear friends, good afternoon. Um, at the outset, wish you all a very happy, prosperous, and a healthy 2021. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce and to welcome and introduce today's colloquium speaker, Professor Ravishankar Nanjundaya, Director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Prior to joining IATM, he was the chair of the Center for Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Ravi, as we call him, as we know him, did his master's in mechanical engineering in 1986 and PhD in Atmospheric Sciences in 1992, both from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He started his research career as a postdoctoral fellow at the Mathematics and Computer Science Division of Oregon National Laboratory, USA. His main research interests are monsoon variability using climate models and predictability. He has more than 90 peer reviewed publications uh, to his credit in national and international journals. He is uh, very active uh, in, uh, is quite active in human resource development. Uh, we know that he has guided several PhD and master students. He currently serves as a member of the editorial advisory board of uh, Dynamics and Statistics of the Climate System, a new journal that was being launched by Oxford University Press uh, from February 2016. And he is also a member of several national and international committees. He was the associate editor of the Journal of Earth System Sciences, published by the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, from 2008 to 2014. He was a visiting faculty at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 2019 and uh, to ICTS TAFR during 2011 to 2014. He was uh, conferred with Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award in 2000 for his research in Earth Sciences by the government of Karnataka. Ravi is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the India Meteorological uh, Society. Today, Ravi will be talking about the variability of monsoons at different scales and the factors that contribute to this variability. Professor Ravi Shankar Nanjundaya, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramnathan. I also thank uh, Professor Raju for giving me this opportunity and also Director PRL for giving me the opportunity to give this first uh, colloquium of 2021 of PRL. It's a great privilege and an honor to be present here, if somewhat virtually. Uh, so I would like to thank you. And also, I would like to wish everybody a healthy, happy, and prosperous new year. Healthy is much more important in today's world rather than anything else. So I again, wish you all a healthy, happy, and prosperous new year. And uh, I'll be talking about the variability of monsoon at different scales. Uh, maybe I'll start sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, is my screen really visible? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. And I'll talk about the variability of the Indian summer monsoon at various scales. Uh, as far as Indian summer monsoon is concerned, the 
the amount of literature that's there is almost like an ocean in itself. It's like as big as the monsoon is what I would like to say. So I'll try to confine with whatever I have understood. Maybe it is a very small part of it. And most of it was in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Professor Arindam Chakraborty, and my students, Nirupam Karmakar and Gaurav Shivasta. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with the basic of the monsoon, what the mean monsoon looks like, and briefly touch upon the cause of the monsoon, and uh, then get a global picture. We then we move on to intraannual variability, and then see what this uh, creature called El Nino is. Afterwards, we'll look at the variability, its own fluctuations and trends at various scales, but is intraannual or decadal, and uh, whether the Enso monsoon relationship is constant or is it changing, and come to a very low frequency variation on multi decadal scales. So, this is the kind of uh, over, overview of the talk I'm going to present today. Uh, so, let's start with the basic that is the mean monsoon. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. This is a picture from June to September. Generally, we take June to September as the period of the Indian summer monsoon. Of course, onset could be a little earlier and the uh, withdrawal could be a little later. But this is the mean as I am more or less. And what you can see is this, the period regions of very high rainfall on the, along the uh, coast of Myanmar and in uh, the northern part of Bay of Bengal and also the western parts. And uh, quite a bit of rain over central part of India. And uh, another interesting thing is if you look at this part, which is consists of uh, Meghalaya and uh, Chirapunji, etc., it's at the same latitude as Saudi Arabia. Now, if we compare, this is one of the wettest places, Chirapunji and minus one. And uh, Saudi Arabia could easily be the driest place in the world. So there is much more to monsoon than just as a you know land. I mean, north-south contrast or something that we talk of. So this is where the Himalayan uh, orography comes into picture and the kind of modulates the uh, Indian summer monsoon in a very big way. And uh, uh, before the satellites came in, we didn't have much idea of the rainfall that was happening over the ocean. And after the satellites came, we found that there was a considerable bit of rainfall over the southern region that is around five south, this region and also along the coast and in the northern part of Bay of Bengal. And thanks to satellite, now we have about 30 odd or 40 odd years of data from the satellites, which have given us a much better picture and much better understanding about uh, the monsoons and how they how it kind of fluctuates. So, and the other interesting thing that we find is this low rainfall region over uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, Sri Lanka, which could perhaps be related to it being on the lee side of uh, the Western Ghats. And also that it's a region of relatively be a small, uh, less uh, sea surface temperatures. So, and also there is a, you can see a sharp delineation that the rainfall in, decreases very sharply as we go westwards into the uh, Arabian Sea. So this is in some sense the broad picture. And uh, the first question we can ask is what causes the monsoon? In high school, we were always taught that it is a land sea contrast. But if you really look at it, the temperatures in July is much lower than in temperatures in May, though the rainfall in July is much higher. And if we do a correlation between uh, temp land temperature and uh, rainfall, we find that it's negatively correlated, which means that the association is negative. That is, the rain, I mean, if the temperatures are lower over land, it actually means that the monsoon is stronger. I mean, it doesn't mean a causation, but certainly an association. So the association itself says that it could not be a land sea contrast. Maybe in the early parts of the monsoon, let's say in uh, end of May, early June, it may play a very major role. But once the monsoon itself kind of gets what we call as the onset, then it's the dynamics and the physics of the monsoon itself takes over. And then uh, it kind of runs by itself. And uh, the land sea contrast certainly doesn't play a role, a major role, you would say, in causing the monsoon further. Next, we can ask whether monsoon is a local or a global system. And this is a picture which, again, thanks to satellites, uh, we find that uh, this is the picture of rainfall that we find in January. And this is the picture that we find in the month of July. So what we can find is that 
this is not a localized system but it's part of a global rainfall band so to speak which kind of seems to move from north to south and uh, so this is what we call as itcz so monsoon is nothing but the manifestation of itcz in our region and uh, if you look at the winds which traditionally kind of define the monsoon we have uh, winds in january which kind of go south of the equator because that's where the itcz is which is nothing but the intertropical convergence zone where the winds converge and uh, when we go to july we find that the convergence has moved northwards in most of the world and uh, quite a bit has, it has come over land the, the wind pattern has kind of flipped from to, to a southwesterly wind that we get in the uh, monsoon season which we call that's why we call it as a southwest monsoon so if you look at the excursion of itcz we find that the, interestingly in other regions of the world if this is the J january mean which is over a long period uh, if you look at july which kind of more or less comes very close to it over rest of the world only over india where it kind of goes as south as parts of madagascar to over india that is what you find that there is the largest excursion of itcz occurs over the indian region and uh, as we know itcz is associated with uh, high rising velocities that is upward ascent and also cloudiness and rainfall and we also say that it's the rising limb of the hadley cell a north south circulation with the rising motion in the itcz that is in this region let's say during a monsoon season and descend around 30 north and 30 south that's where the descent occurs and that's also the, so the reason the reason why most of the deserts occur in this uh, latitudes where the descending air kind of prevents much rainfall and convection and clouds to happen and hence you have the deserts there so but i'll not go much into the details of the hadley cell which itself would take quite a bit of a discussion so i'll in the interest of time i'll just say that it's a rising limb of the hadley cell is itcz and monsoon is nothing but the manifestation of itcz in our region if you look at the onset of the monsoon monsoon onset over the indian region starts in late may earliest is around 22nd of may which occurs during the over the andamans and thailand a little later it occurs over myanmar around 25th of may and the onset over india occurs over kerala around 1st june which is always eagerly awaited and we always are discussing come the month of may when it is really sweltering whether the monsoon will be on time or will it be delayed and generally 1st june is uh, the date of course there is a kind of a variation of about a week any date between 23rd may to 7th of june would be we could still consider it as a normal onset and a little later around 7th may these are the 7th june this is like the mean dates there will could be variation now every year it is not like an army marching on time it is a non linear system and there could be fluctuations because of various reasons reasons and uh, around 7th june the onset occurs over karnataka and over mumbai it occurs around 10th to uh, that is around 11th june 10 to 11 days after it the onset occurs over kerala and over delhi it kind of reaches around 27th of june by mid july most of the country is covered by the monsoon these are the mean pictures i mean it can there can be large fluctuations between year to year which is what we call as the interannual variability of the monsoon also and if you look at the early part of monsoon during may there is hardly any rain most of it is confined to kind of a thunderstorm activity over southern part of india and sometimes there could be an onset uh, occurring in early uh, late part of may in june it covers quite a bit of the country and uh, you start getting rain over northern parts also though the amount of rainfall that we get is kind of primarily con confined to western ghats the myanmar mountains and parts of southern india and of course you get this whole of uh, low rainfall over uh, the sri lanka and tamil nadu and if you look at it we don't get much rain over punjab and rajasthan at this time of the year that is in may and june june july and august which we call as the <clears throat> peak monsoon period most of the country is covered by rain and uh, there is significant rainfall over the what we call as a monsoon trough region there is a secondary rain band over the indian ocean which is also prominent <clears throat> and there is low rainfall over 
Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu, which I again mentioned previously. This, this picture is largely the same. Of course, a slight difference between the July and August pictures, but largely the big picture is about the same. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a sharp gradient of rainfall over Arabian Sea, and that could be related to the fact that the sea surface temperatures over this part of uh, Arabian Sea is much, much smaller as compared to uh, the eastern parts of uh, the Arabian Sea. And we'll come to the SST and rainfall relationship in a moment. And that perhaps could explain why this is happening. And this is the withdrawal phase of monsoon, which is September and uh, October. When uh, Though in September, most of the country is still covered by uh, the monsoon and it's kind of starts withdrawing, it, there is still reasonable rainfall. Uh, over most of the country. And when we come to October, when the withdrawal is really strong, you can see only the southern parts of India had, had, has some rainfall. And uh, that's more or less like the uh, withdrawal or the kind of completely the rest of the country or most of the country becomes dry. So this is an overview of the mean picture of the monsoons. And we know that uh, if we are looking at the monsoon, there are periods when it rains very copiously. And also, it, there are periods when it doesn't rain at all within the monsoon season. And uh, these we call as the uh, active and break spells. And long periods when there is no rain is called a long break. That is usually about three to five days. There are various definitions of break. But about if it is more than three days, if you don't get any rain or rain less than one, uh, some threshold, then we call it as a break. And long periods when monsoon is vigorous, we call it as the active spells. So these are like the active spells and these are like the break spells. And if you look at various years, for example, here we are looking at two years. So one is 1975 when the mean rainfall was nine, 99 centimeters, which is well above the normal. And in 2002, which was a drought year when the mean rainfall was just 71 centimeters, you, you had these long breaks in 2002 when it was a drought and there were fewer such events of weak monsoon uh, during the, uh, the when the year is stronger. So that means basically long and persistent breaks can lead to droughts. And if you have long periods of active, which we call as the intraseasonal variability to a certain extent, you could call it as we have these active and break spells. And if you look at the mean picture of active and break spells, over uh, active spell, you get rain over the central part of the country. That is what we call as a continental trough zone during the active phase. And rainfall is essentially confined to this region, that is northeast and the foothills in the <clears throat> break spells. Peninsular India usually gets higher rainfall during the weak spells. And uh, it's not just that these are all, this is like the composite picture. And what is the uh, variation in space and time within a season? Is there a, I mean, is it just a random pattern where the rain kind of keeps happening randomly or is there a kind of more to it and there seem to be, is there a pattern within that? That's what we are going to look at next. <coughs> so what we find is the, one of the characteristics of the Indian summer monsoon is the northward propagation of these rain bands, which incidentally was found first by Sikka and Dargil in the year 1980 and at about the same time, Yasunari also found it. And uh, these rain bands kind of start around Phi South and they move northward. And typically periods between the movement of these rain bands is about 25 to 30 days. And this is something which is ubiquitous only for the Indian region and to a certain extent over Western Pacific, the, that we find such consistent poleward movements. In other parts of the world, if there is a poleward movement that might happen in a particular year or once in a way, but never in a consistent way that we find over the Indian and the West Pacific regions. Uh, why these rain bands move northward is a, still a matter of research. There is There are plenty of theories ranging from the shear uh, gradient of the shear or the gradient of instability in a thermodynamic sense and in a dynamic sense, the gradient of the shear. There are various mechanisms which, which have been proposed. But the final word, I think, is still to be uh, mentioned about this, the exact mechanism of poleward propagation. And we do find that they play a major role in reviving active spells after a break. 
usually and uh, after a break the revival can happen either by a brain band moving from the west, east or from a, a, a movement of a rain band from the southern region from the south uh, five south into the monsoon trough region and sometimes there could be an in situ generation of the rain band also all the three are always possible so let's look at the space time structure of intra seasonal variations so if we look at the rainfall data you see this bands and this is for 2005 and this is for 2011 and they kind of correspond whenever you get much many of these uh, poleward propagations you get fairly strong rainfall and uh, the active break spells which have a periodicity typical periodicity ranging from 15 to 30 days so we would like to know are there multiple time scales in in, in the intra seasonal oscillations iso as we generally call them or and does it have just a meridional structure that we have seen or is there a zonal and a meridional structure of this variation so that's what we are going to examine next so if we kind of talk of the types of isos this especially this kind of information we could get thanks to satellites we have now about uh, 20 more than 20 years from trim and gpm at fine spatial and temporal scales and we have tried to identify spatio temporal structures of the iso for this purpose we use what's called as a multi channel single spectra singular spectrum analysis technique to uh, to extract the spatio temporal structure of iso if you want the details it's in my students paper of 2016 in mwr and what our analysis showed that there are two distinct modes of intra seasonal oscillations a high frequency oscillation with a period of about 10 to 20 days and a low frequency oscillation of a period which is greater than 20 days so if you look at the spatial structure of the low frequency iso we find that it has a very rich structure if we start from phase 5 we find that the rain band is essentially over the southern region then we also find that there is a kind of an eastward movement and as it moves eastward we also find that there is a northward movement here which kind of becomes more progressive here and then it kind of reaches over mainland india and then strengthens here stays there and then a second band starts here and then the process kind of continues so it starts somewhere around five south as we have already seen but there is also a zonal structure to it and uh, but the movement of the band essentially at the low frequency seems to be that of the north south direction that though, though there is a little tilt as you can see that on the western side it seems to move a little faster as compared to the eastern side uh, so this is the structure of what we call as the low frequency that is when you are looking at a mode which has more than 20 days period and uh, if we are looking at the maximum of rainfall they are most prominent over bay of bengal and uh, the rainfall seems to be less over arabian sea as compared to bay of bengal they start here in the equatorial uh, indian ocean and culminate over the foothills of himalayas and if you look at uh, the the indian subcontinent the western parts have highest LS, lf iso variability now if you look at the high frequency iso which we defined as something which is having 10 to 20 days anything less than 10 days we tend to call them as the synoptic scale variability it also has a very rich structure we divided it into eight phases each of them about two days apart and we see that there is a north northeast word moment as we see here a northeast word moment here that you can see and over arabian sea it is more like a northward movement and over bay of bengal the movement is north northwest word so it's kind of a complex structure and in addition to that we find that there is something from the mid latitudes which kind of combines with what's happening over the bay of bengal and they combine together to call this uh, to form this strengthening of the rain band over the head bay and parts of bangladesh and west bengal and of course adjoining northeast region and this is a mid latitude interaction which we could find out thanks to the large amount of uh, satellite data that we could analyze for the period we have analyzed it for the period of 1998 2040 so this is a kind of an overview of the uh, spatial structure of the low frequency iso and the high frequency iso so if we look at what is the relationship between iso and active break cycle so 
this is the picture where we have looked at uh, from 98 to 2014 and we are we have uh, mentioned this as the indian rainfall anomaly then the star line i don't know how whether you can see it is the hf iso intensity and the diamond shape this one is the lf iso variability so what we find is lf iso primarily modulates the rainfall events the large events that happen it the it kind of creates an environment for the large scale events to happen uh, over central india and hf iso plays a significant role in modulating the probability of occurrence of rainfall over the central indian region if you look at the variability about 15 to 45 percent of variability is explained by the low frequency iso and the high frequency iso explains about 7 to 18 percent of uh, variability interestingly if you look at the phase of uh, lf iso and ismr the correlation is minus 0 0.064 and correlation between high frequency iso and ismr is 0.73 and when we look at the probability of events this is a phase diagram between hf iso and lf iso and we are looking at a plus one event then we find uh, that uh, whenever hf iso is stronger then uh, in a phase where uh, LFI also tends to be weak, that's when we get a uh, stronger uh, rainfall event. You can see that here. This is the LFI also, and this is the HFI also. So they combine together in this fashion to give you a fairly strong rainfall event, which is, would be like more like an active spell. So now the third scale that we have seen, we have talked of the low, high, low frequency variability of the intra-seasonal variation, the high frequency which is between 10 to 20 days. The low frequency was about anything greater than 20 days to about 90 days. The length of the season itself is about 120 days. So anything less than 10 days, we, have, we call them as uh, the synoptic scale. And the synoptic scale is kind of dominated by lows and depressions. And interestingly, there is a pattern to the lows and depressions during the active phase, which is the picture on the left side, and during the break phase. What we find is that during an active phase, all the, low, the these lows and depressions tend to move along the, the monsoonal trough while they are kind of scattered all over the place during a break phase. And uh, this is a, a very interesting thing which was first, uh, I mean, studied by Joseph and many others have studied it, that this kind of a clustering happens in uh, ac uh, active phase while that clustering is relatively less, very few a kind of move along the, uh, the monsoon trough during the break phase. And uh, these are of course very short lived events, about three to five days, but then they do give a lot of rainfall uh, over the Indian region. So we have seen what happens within, we have seen the mean monsoon, we have seen what happens within a season. Now we would like to know whether monsoon varies from year to year. Of course, all of us know that it rains copiously in one year and much less in some other year. We generally have scarcity in years where it rains less and we call them as droughts. We have occurrence of more occurrence of floods in years when it rains more. These are excess years. But interestingly, what we should remember is that rainfall is never evenly spread. It is likely that some parts of India may have floods even in a drought year. And also some parts may have relatively less and almost on the verge of a drought, even if the All India rainfall is an excess one, because the uh, rainfall is never uniform. And we also have seen that northeast part of India tends to move in a phase which is opposite or nearly opposite to the rest of the country. So if it rains copiously over most of India, then northeast may have less rainfall and vice versa. So it's never uniform. So within a uh, drought year, you may get a lot of, uh, uh, there could be regions where there could be floods and even in excess here we could still have areas where there could be deficit rainfall and perhaps a drought. So if you look at drought then 2002 was a major drought and this is a picture for July when the rain kind of spectacularly failed and uh, that was when people kind of woke up after a long period after 1987 uh, we didn't have a major drought and after 1994 we didn't have a the flood year also, but rainfall was near normal. So people had become, I guess, a little complacent and it was a wake up call for all the people who were doing predictions 
that uh, and it this was not expected and it was a fairly a dramatic drought one of the strongest droughts when it was about 20% below its long term mean and we we can see that it the rainfall was much much smaller over northwest parts of india punjab and over most parts of india and uh, the opposite was the case in july 2003 which was a near normal year when it was kind of very widely well spread out and we got a near normal year so this is the kind of a major contrast that you can see between rainfall in a drought year and a normal year or an excess year so if we look at year to year variation which we call as the intraannual variability we know that uh, not all years have the same monsoon strength some years with strong monsoon and some years with weak monsoon that you can see this is the picture from all india rainfall based on the iitm's homogeneous india uh, monthly rainfall data set uh, which has been painstakingly collected and uh, you can see that there are years when it is largely where very large negatives have happened and also years when it has been fairly strong and uh, this, uh, the circles show whether it is what we call as an uh, el nino year or a la nina year the blue circles are the la nina years the red circles are the el nino years so is there a relationship between la nina el nino and perhaps the fl uh, floods that's what we are also go going to look at in a moment so if you look at the enso ismr relationship we know that quite a few droughts are related to el nino this is the enso index and this is the normalized ismr anomaly so enso index we have flipped in sign so that positive means it's favorable for the monsoon otherwise generally if it is uh, the other way if you just calculate the anomaly of the uh, nino 3.4 then it will be negative so the picture will be just slightly different that it should be kind of going in this direction that is uh, whenever the nino is in this case it's positive that means it is favorable we have because we flipped the sign of it we get in this quadrant that is uh, excess rainfall most of the blues that you see which are excess rainfall years are when the el nino is not uh, unfavorable for us and the years which are major droughts the reds that you see here are years when uh, el nino was relatively strong so the correlation between enso and monsoon if you just look at it as the el nino means as this is the anomaly is about minus 0.53 and it looks like uh, enso disrupts what we call as the walker circulation which in turn modifies the hadley cell and has an impact on the monsoon so we will take a quick detour from study of monsoons to what is a uh, walker circulation and what is el nino and then come back to variability of monsoon at various scales so walker circulation is nothing but it's kind of a zonally what we had seen up till now was more like a zonally average circulation the north south direction in this direction and uh, this view may not be completely correct there could be much more to it and we know that near the equator we find significant differences in upward velocities if you look at the upward velocities here the negative means that it is upward this is the pressure velocities and positive means that it is in the downward direction so it is not just that it's a, we can average it in the in this direction and talk only of a variation in the north south direction so what we find is that over the western pacific that is close to the indonesian region there is intense ascent while if we go towards the american coast there is descent so uh, does it mean that there is a east west circulation we do find that there is such a circulation and this is what we call as the walker circulation named after sir gilbert walker who was one of the first director general of the india meteorological department and uh, the walker circulation this is another picture of that there is rising motion of the indonesian coast which is the, what we call as the western pacific and descending motion or uh, across uh, near the american coast and uh, we might ask ourselves what causes this zonal circulation so if you look at the sea surface temperature pattern we find that the sea surface temperatures are relatively colder on the uh, eastern or the uh, american coast and much much warmer on the west uh, west pacific coast and uh, this also coincides with regions of high ascent and low rainfall with descent so the next question that we would like to ask is does how does the sst affect the rainfall and ascent and this is the sst rainfall relationship 
what we find and uh, on the x-axis is the sea surface temperature from 20 degrees to 32 degrees <clears throat> and this is the rainfall <clears throat> in millimeters per day so till we reach about 27 the rainfall kind of re re increases slightly or linearly you could say in some sense and after that there is a dramatic increase in rainfall and uh, it is uh, so uh, if you look at the eastern and the western parts of uh, uh, the SSTs, this is well below the 27 degree threshold and this is well above the 27 degree threshold. So there is a lot of convection that is upward motion and cloudiness and rainfall on this part and relatively less on the eastern coast. So now if we ask what causes this structure, then uh, what we find is that uh, this is a kind of a coupled system. If you look at the surface wind, we find that the winds are generally westward, that is easterlies, which we also call as the trade winds. Near the coast of Peru, the winds are also northward, which causes upwelling at the eastern end of the basin and easterlies along the equator. And this causes the thermocline to be very shallow, which means the colder water can easily come up to the surface. On the western side, the thermocline is much, uh, there is the piling up of water, so to speak, and the thermocline is much, much deeper. And hence, even if there is any upward motion of the colder water, the, th the thickness is large, so it, uh, it cannot have a much of an effect on the sea surface temperature. So this kind of uh, asymmetry kind of sustains uh, more cloudiness and rainfall on the western side and less cloudiness and rainfall on the eastern side. So this is another picture of that and I'll not go into it. In, uh, so this is the Southern Oscillation Index, which is the uh, atmospheric counterpart of the, uh, the, the El Nino, the, I mean, that ocean SST. So there are years when the SSTs uh, uh, tend to be colder and years when it is warmer. So the, then the uh, Southern Oscillation Index, which we call as a difference in the temperature pressure between Tahati and Darwin from the long term variation, positive values indicate strong walker circulation, negative values indicate weaker circulation. You find that the SOI is quasi periodic and negative SOI occurs with El Nino and positive with La Nina. So if you look at why the walker circulation weakens, what we find is generally we had clouding here. This clouding for some reason, I mean, the SSTs also warm up here and they sustain uh, clouds and rainfall here, which disrupts the walker circulation and the rainfall instead of happening at the western end happens in the central Pacific. There are many theories which uh, about El Nino. The most prevalent one is that there is a wind, westerly wind burst related to rainfall activity on intra-seasonal scale, which kind of leads to an intraannual variability. The weakening of easterlies reduces upwelling and the thermocline deepens over central and eastern Pacific. And the two regions warm and then we get clouding rain and uh, convection. So if you go back to ISMR relationship, we find that whenever this uh, uh, ENSO occurs, it kind of uh, disrupts the walker circulation, which in turn kind of disrupts the hydraulic circulation. There are also many theories, one of which we will also talk about the mid-latitude interaction in a moment. And that uh, disrupts uh, the monsoon and can have an effect. But what we find is that not all monsoon year, years are related to ENSO. There could be years which uh, could be, there could be some other player which is also could be coming in. So what is this other player that could be playing a major role in modulating uh, Indian summer monsoon on a year to year basis? This we find is nothing but the Indian Ocean teleconnection. SSTs in the Indian Ocean also uh, show a seesaw. There are some years when it is much warmer here, which we call as a positive dipole and the uh, uh, sea surface temperature is colder here. And the opposite occurs, which we call as a negative dipole. And generally what we find is that if the uh, positive dipole occurs or if there is more clouding on the western side of the Indian Ocean, then it leads to a stronger monsoon and the opposite. That is when there is a negative dipole or there is more convection on the eastern side, it leads to a weaker monsoon. And uh, just like we had ENSO and uh, Southern Oscillation, ENSO was nothing but uh, uh, El Nino was the ocean one and the Southern Oscillation was the atmospheric counterpart. Just like that, we, can, we have the equino and the dipole. So when uh, the, not every equino is related to a dipole, 
but most of the dipoles occur when there is a positive equino and uh, this is also a coupled event and uh, generally as i said positive equino or a dipole is favorable for the indian monsoon and vice versa so if you look at droughts and teleconnections if you do a phase diagram where we have this is the measure of uh, equino or dipole you could say and and so we can kind of whenever both are very favorable then we get a stronger monsoon and when both are unfavorable then the probability of getting uh, ex a negative or a drought is much higher so these two seem to be the major uh, players you could say in some sense in uh, kind of modulating droughts and also the teleconnections the exact mechanism of these linkages as i said earlier is still a matter of research so we found the intraannual variability that is year uh, year to year variability now we ask ourselves whether there are trends in, uh, in the uh, or fluctuations in monsoon variability that is is the monsoon uh, and so monsoon relationship the same over time and also does the monsoon show variability on decadal scales and if these if there is any such variability what causes this variability that's what we are going to kind of look at very briefly in the next few slides so the, if you look at trends in variability intra seasonal one we have seen that intra seasonal which we have we we previously classified as the lfiso and the hfiso that is the low frequency intra seasonal oscillation and the high frequency intra seasonal oscillation we also examined the space time structure of these oscillations we will now examine if the same uh, change from decade to year year to year or they remain the same and if there is a what is the possible cause uh, cause for this and uh, since uh, the satellite data is uh, much shorter we went back to the imd graded data which runs for a much longer period and uh, we found and we did the same analysis of mssa for uh, and also got similar structures just now this was only over the indian land and uh, we tried to look at the uh, the intensity of intra seasonal variations at various scales which is the lfiso hfiso and also on the synoptic scale so what we found that over a period from let's say 1948 onwards to 2014 when we stopped our analysis there is a decreasing trend in the lfiso variability interestingly the high frequency variability more or less remained constant over this period but the synoptic activity seems to have increased in time from 1955 to 2005 so does it mean that there is a scale interaction between the lfiso and synoptic scales so that's something let us look at and see what it means so if we look at iso and extremes sorry this is a very busy figure the top one is something that you have already seen that's the phases of the lfiso this is the phases of the hfiso and the extreme events occurring in each of these phases that is in phase 1 of lfiso what are the where is the number of extreme events that is rainfall events which is are greater than 99 percentile and this is the occurrence of extreme events where in different phases of hfiso which is the this, this is the phases of the hfiso this is the phases of the lfiso and this is the occurrence of the extreme events what we find that the phase of lfiso over see uh, is strong in the uh, and extreme events if you look at different phases this was a strong uh, when the iso is strongest over the central indian region you find that the probability of occurrence of extreme events is much larger over this region and uh, much less in the other phases but such a relationship is not seen between the high frequency iso and the synoptic activity so this relationship is much weaker and whether this we will, as we will see whether this relationship is constant or is it changing so for this we did was we divided the data from 1951 to uh, present and uh, we said that uh, uh, one we called as the 1951 to 1980 which we called as the pre period and this is the difference between the post period 1950 sorry it should be to 2010 or 2014 minus pre this is the difference so this is the picture that we get at different uh, things and uh, this is in the break spells this is in the transition from active to break uh, or break to active 
and this is in the active space. So this is the actual ones which was there in the pre-picture and this is the difference that we are getting. And what we find is that the uh, extreme events are now increasing during a break and transition periods. And there is a decrease in the number of extreme events during an active period. So what does that mean for the intraseasonal activity? So how does that affect? So that's what we tried to understand. And we did some analysis. And the gist of it is presented in this diagram. And we also did some GCM simulations with simulated heating to understand this. And they also bear this out. So basically, what it means is that if there are more extremes, uh, rainfall events in the breaks, it leads to weaker easterly shear in the break to active transition, which in, in, uh, leads to increased atmospheric stability. And this weaker easterly shear, easterly shear uh, causes uh, polar propagation or intraseasonal activity that uh, reduces. So there is less rain in the active phase. And in turn, there is a decrease in the seasonal mean. It also means decreased variability in the LFISO scale and hence a reduction in the intensity of LFISO. So the in, uh, if I have to explain it, it will take a bit of a time and interest of time. I'm just kind of giving you the gist of it. And this picture shows how that kind of happens. And many other studies also have shown that there is an increase in extreme rainfall activity in during the monsoon period. So, and they have attributed it to anthropogenic climate change. We also find that there's an increase in extreme rainfall activity, especially in the breaks. And that perhaps is also related to climate change. So climate change could be causing this change in the intraseasonal oscillations also. So now we'll kind of strike a slight detour. That is, we have been just looking at only Indian monsoon. We'll now look at just a moment for over the West Africa, because we will also look at the Indian monsoon ENSO teleconnections. And uh, there seems to be a player over West Africa, which can also kind of modulate this. So we look at the West African monsoon. And like uh, India, West Africa also has a monsoon. And there is a slight difference in the seasonal cycle. There's the reds are the in the seasonal cycle over India, and the other one is the uh, West African monsoon. Data for West African monsoon, we took it from the crew data set from East Anglia. And if you look at the seasonal, uh, the variation from month to month, rainfall in, in, in India peaks in July, while the rainfall in uh, West Africa peaks in August. So now what we would like to see is if there is an influence of El Nino on the West African monsoon, or is it kind of independent of it? So we again look at the same intraannual variability of uh, ISMR. This is for Indian summer monsoon and ENSO, which we have already looked at. And this is the West African monsoon and ENSO. We again find that uh, uh, large droughts or reduction in rainfall in a year uh, in the West African monsoon is also related to and so there is and so events which occur and uh, if you look at in statistical terms 45 percent of ismr and 39 percent of wesm rainfall extremes are associated with and so so does it mean that there's a triangular relationship between and so ismr and uh, west african monsoon or it, it doesn't exist so that's what we would like to look at next and we try to see what this kind of a triangle is between these three events so if you look at on a decadal scale between West African summer monsoon, Indian summer monsoon, and ENSO, this is the picture, this is the line which shows the correlation, a 21 year running correlation for West Africa. And this is for the Indian summer monsoon. What I would like to point out is that this uh, axis is negative. So lower means it is stronger. So if you look at this, when the period when the West African monsoon was stronger, the Indian summer monsoon had a weaker relationship with ENSO. And when the Indian summer monsoon had a stronger relationship, then uh, the West African monsoon relationship with uh, ENSO kind of weakened. And now it looks like this was the pre-80, which also kind of the, around 1980, there was again a shift. Many people have talked of the climatic shift of the 1980s. 
uh, of the 70s, which kind of culminated after, became stronger after the 1980s effect. So we now find that it is possible that the West African summer monsoon has a stronger correlation, while the Indian summer monsoon may have a weaker correlation with the Indian, uh, with the ENSO. Many studies have shown it, including that by Krishna Kumar, and they have again attributed this to uh, climate change. So what we see in some sense is a kind of a seesaw in a relationship. So if you look at uh, the latitude, how this variation has happened, uh, regressions, then we find that uh, coefficients are, there's a large change between the pre-period and the post-period. This is over West Africa and this is over East Africa, especially over the core monsoon zones, we find a large change in the regression coefficients with uh, El Nino. And uh, we find that, uh, as I said, and so I summer was stronger in between 1948 to 1980, and uh, and so was weaker, and vice versa from 1985 to 2018. And the impact of ENSO is seen to change significantly in the core monsoon zones of Indian summer monsoon and WASM. This is what I was talking about in a moment. So now let's look at the relationship between ENSO and monsoon. This is one of the mechanisms. What it says is that the El Nino modifies the upper tropospheric uh, temperatures and hence the temp upper tropospheric temperature gradient between ocean and land over India uh, through mid-latitude Rossby wave activity. And the meridional temperature gradient, what we find is that it's much stronger. This is the climatology picture that we are talking of. And this is the composite of El Nino minus La Nina and it's stronger during an El Nino over India, which is about five to seven degrees as compared to West Africa, where it is about two to four degrees. This reduction in gradient, which occurs, that is, there is a cooling during a El Nino. This occurs and then that kind of reduces the tropical easterly jet and also impacts the, both the monsoons together. So this is another picture of the same. And what we are seeing is that uh, now we are seeing in the pre-80 period, this was the picture that uh, the, the cooling here was much larger and the cooling was here was much weaker. And hence, the negative temperature anomaly northwest of uh, ISM region weakens after 1980. That is in this period, that is it is kind of weakening here. And El Nino associated cooling shifted to Africa, which was much weaker here, has now become much stronger here. So the, this kind of a shift happens in the upper tropospheric temperature cooling, which uh, we again, we we have looked at it uh, with the Rossby wave activity. There could be many other mechanisms. This is a possible mechanism that we have studied. And in addition, there's one more player, which is called as the Atlantic Nino, which again, uh, if the Atlantic Nino is positive, this, uh, this is the Nino region of Atlantic, Nino 3 region of Atlantic. If this is positive, then there is higher rain. And if it is negative, you get a Weaker, uh, weaker West African summer monsoon. And this relationship between Atlantic and ENSO is also changing. Relationship between Atlantic Nino and ENSO has changed significantly in the post 80s period. So if you look at post, these are the blues, there is a relationship. And previously there was not much and it did not have an effect on the Atlantic Nino. After 1980, uh, El, El Nino La Nina is coincidental with positive or negative Atlantic 3. A negative uh, Atlantic 3 Nino reduces the West African rainfall. And that is also related to the fact that there is an ENSO at that time. So the uh, WASM uh, ENSO monsoon strengthens after uh, 1980 and it was weaker before that. And this is a schematic picture of what happened. In the pre-80s, there was a weak cooling in the mid latitudes as far as Africa was concerned, and suppression of the WASM rainfall. Well, there was an enhancement because of the Nino in Atlantic, and there was a destructive interf uh, interference, which led to a weak and so WASM relationship. While in the post 80s, there is a stronger cooling in the mid latitude. We saw the shift in towards the west, which causes a suppression of the WASM <clears throat> rainfall. And the cooling also, uh, uh, with an El Nino, there is a cooling of the tropical Atlantic, which kind of suppresses the WASM rainfall, and hence leads to a strong ENSO-West African monsoon relationship. 
So this is the overall picture which combines Indian rainfall, uh, West African rainfall and the El Nino. And uh, what we have shown is only for an El Nino here. Maximum of El Nino associated with mid latitude. It shifted. This is the pre-El Nino period. And uh, <clears throat> this is in the post, uh, sorry, post pre period of uh, pre 80s. And this is the post period. And previously there used to be a warmer SST. Now there is a colder SST. So the combined effect has been that there is reduced moisture flux in these regions. And hence, there is a kind of a reduction in rainfall in West Africa. And also this change in the temperature gradients also has affected, has reduced the effect over India and increased the effect over West Africa. So now finally we look at, at a very large scale. So if you look at the period of rainfall for a long period, we find that uh, there is uh, nearly 67 year periodicity, which we call as the ultra low frequency uh, ISMR variability. This seems to, uh, if we look at it uh, at the envelope, this as an envelope, we find that when it is positive, there are fewer droughts. And when it is negative, there are more droughts. So negative phase of ISMR will is favor more favorable for droughts than what is appears to be. And this is the same thing with about total number of years of floods and favorable phase for both drought and flood. So it has a bigger impact on the droughts as compared to floods. So this is the floods and droughts in negative and positive ISM URL phase. At the top left shows positive ISM URL where you have kind of floods in that. And this is in the negative URL. Uh, so you can see that there is much more stronger rainfall events happening. And the bottom left shows the same thing for droughts. And it is much more intense when the ISM URL is negative, then you have much stronger droughts. That's what it is. That's the major take home message from this. And if you regress ISM URL with uh, JCAS ASTs, we find that there is a kind of a north south uh, different. Uh, the SST difference seems to modulate the ISM URL. But what we find is that this relationship is also kind of weakened after the 1990s. And that again could be related to the fact that climate change is more prominent after the 90s. So that in effect is kind of a brief overview of, of variability at different scales. There are many other studies. I'm not saying that I have covered all the studies that have been done. There are many studies which look at all these things, whether it's the low frequency variability or the intra-seasonal variability or year to year variation. There are many mechanisms, many theories, many studies from different angles. But what we have done is just kind of whatever we have looked at in the last 15 to 20 years, we have kind of presented it. And this is the summary of it, that IS, uh, Indian monsoon is a part of the global system, shows significant fluctuation within a season, what we call as active and break spells, intra-seasonal activity, which we have again seen, and that it is affected by uh, El Nino. And that El Nino monsoon relationship also changes on a decadal scale, and that there is a very low frequency decadal variability. And it appears that climate change seems to be affecting the variability of the monsoon itself. So, with this, I would like to stop and take any questions. And thank you. And I would like to acknowledge my all my students and colleagues at IAC and IID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. So it's not without reason they say that uh, clarity is a virtue. Okay. I hope I was <laughs> there was clarity in my presentation. <laughs> it, was, it was very lucid. It was very clear. And uh, uh, the various facets of Indian summer monsoon from the uh, fewer number of variability days versus all the way to the seasons and also the advanced uh, level of knowledge and the challenges that are there, I think uh, was very, very clearly brought um, by you to the audience. So I was really, I mean, it was very, very nice feeling listening to you talk about this one, which is kind of Though everybody thinks, everybody knows monsoon. The moment you say monsoon, this word is like, 
and everybody understands so they think but the kind of um, difficulty and the challenges those are there were clearly brought out uh, very nicely in the one hour time frame that is that is equally important in order to uh, make it an attractive uh, uh, discussion and a colloquium so let us see if there are any questions <clears throat> Okay, um, there is a question from Satyendra Bandari. Um, while the southwest and northeast monsoons do represent distinct regimes characterized by wind reversal, would there be merit in studying the interannual variability by considering the whole, including southwest and the northeast Indian monsoon? Okay. Uh, right now, whatever I have mentioned is about the southwest monsoon. Northeast monsoon, I have not dealt with in my present study. Uh, I would say that uh, the way things act, uh, maybe the El Nino monsoon relationship could be different for a uh, northeast monsoon as compared to southwest monsoon. And also the dipole itself, which kind of starts developing later in the season, can have a different uh, kind of a effect on the northeast monsoon. So I think it is better to kind of keep them separate and study them though if you look at the large scale picture is nothing but the itc is moving a little more southward as far as the northeast monsoon is concerned and a little more northward in the southwest monsoon in that sense it is the same but the way others are going to the teleconnections could be different so i think it's better to kind of study the two separately that's what i would like to mention okay from parthasar timukopadhyay if the extreme events and the LF ISO are so well correlated, when then why the extremes are not predicted well with longer lead time, unlike the LF ISO? Can you please elaborate? Slide number 40. He also mentions That's the slide right. number. <laughs> well, Partha is always like that. <laughs> Very ridiculous. <laughs> Partha, you put me on a spot, but okay, I'll try to answer. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, we can kind of, I mean, it's like an envelope. We know that, okay, there could be LFISO if it's in a particular phase. The likelihood of extreme events could be higher in that. Uh, but exact where it is going to occur, we may not be able to say. We may be able to say the probability of extreme events could be higher in this particular mode of LFISO, but exactly where it is going to occur, that's going to be always a tougher problem. And Partha works on short term uh, predictions. And he knows how tough that problem is. So perhaps we may know the envelope, but we don't know where what is inside that envelope in some sense. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I would like to answer that way. Yeah. Harish Gadvi from PR is global warming expected to have effect on variability? Yeah, I think so because most studies have shown that the extreme events are increasing. And our study with whatever uh, we have done, is whatever I presented right now is only with observations. I have not talked of uh, modeling at all. Uh, but it is showing that there is an increase in uh, the synoptic activity and a reduction in the low frequency activity. So, And uh, uh, the uh, anthropogenic climate change studies are also showing the same thing. So I think uh, global warming is having an effect on the variability. We actually have a paper actually which is now submitted which shows that uh, the size of the intraseasonal oscillation is going to change and the center is also going to um, change. The position of the intraseasonal activity also is changing but that's still under review. So I mean uh, it's still a matter of uh, criticism but the fact is that it, whatever data we have seen from models they also show that there is a change in intraseasonal activity. From Ravi Bhushan PRL, last two decades has seen warming of the northern Indian Ocean. In view of this, how monsoon has seen changes during the last two decades? Uh, well, there has been changes, as we have said, the relationship also. Uh, we know that there is a relationship between Indian Ocean and Indian uh, summer monsoon. And uh, we did see, uh, if we look at it, the before 2019, the previous year with excess rainfall was in 1994, which is almost like a 25 year period. We didn't have any excess rainfall. And uh, 
we did do though we did have a lot of droughts uh, we did see a long term trend in reduction in rainfall and some people have said that this is related to i think even roxy has a paper which also has kind of related the warming of the northern indian ocean with uh, india summer monsoon uh, the changes in india summer monsoon so there is uh, a change and there could be a, this reduction could be related to the fact that the northern indian ocean is warming and that can have an effect on the monsoon certainly Som Kumar Sharma from PRL. He thanks you for your nice talk. Um, he writes, "ITCZ CZ is one of the major drivers of the Indian summer monsoon. Is there any long-term changes noted in ITCZ dynamics? Any detectable impact of this on the Indian summer monsoon?" Uh, if you look at Indian uh, summer monsoon itself as a ITCZ over our region. so whatever changes that i have mentioned whether it's in the, the changes long term changes in the intra seasonal scale that is the changes in itcz uh having said that there are also many studies which uh, people have done which shows that the breadth of itcz itself is or the itcz itself is kind of moving northward so that certainly and we also are seeing from uh, uh, data from models that there is a kind of a movement of uh, intra seasonal variability also is kind of changing which is kind of the center of the action is kind of moving northwards is also we have noticed in one of our studies though it's still uh, out there and under review so yes it is having an impact so itcz dynamics is having an impact that is uh, people are saying that itcz is kind of there is a northward shift in it and that is of course going to affect our monsoon it's part of the itcz system Amit Bhagwar from PRL is there any relationship between the moving rain bands and the atmospheric rivers okay uh atmospheric rivers if we look at it in our uh, indian context is nothing but the uh, let's say the water vapor which is coming through the vestal jet that we can consider that as an uh, atmospheric river for us and we do find that the vestal jet has an impact on the indian summer monsoon and is also affected by the indian summer monsoon there is a kind of a, a feedback effect westerly jet itself is modulated by the heating of indian summer monsoon and that in turn feeds in the moisture which in turn affects the strength of it so there is a relationship and if you look at it we have not studied the relationship between let's say the westerly jet and the indian summer monsoon but i am sure where the position of the maximum rainfall is based on it there could be a change in the, um, the westerly jet itself we know that when it's a break period the westerly jet kind of avoids the indian region and goes south of it and there is a northward shift in the westerly jet when the monsoon is very much stronger so there is a difference i mean there is an impact and there is a relationship on the intra seasonal scale between active breaks and so active spell and a break spell he continues with another question how may uh, indo pacific warm Will affect the ISO pattern and the ISMR in future. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Uh, uh, if we look at the eastern end of the Indo-Pacific warm pool, which is nothing but the eastern end, or uh, sorry, the Indonesian end of it, if you want to say it, east of, uh, west of Indonesia, which is the eastern end of your Indonesian dipole, uh, if it is warmer. then the likelihood of many events occurring over the indian region could be less that is the what we call as a negative dipole event so then you may have more uh, convective activity over the let's say the bay of bengal but not over the mainland and if it is uh, the western end is much warmer then maybe there would be more rainfall on the uh, over the indian landmass so the i think that uh, that's how it could be changing the iso pattern we are not really studied that but that that is my intuition and if this pattern changes then it certainly is going to affect because we know that all the rain bands are kind of starting at the around phi south so if this indo pacific warm pool is going to change then where it kind of starts these northward moving events where it's going to start if it that could also get changed and it can have an effect on ismr in future okay 
what he continues with another question what is the reason for negative um, iod phase oh okay he is taking my viva i think <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that's your thing it's all right <laughs> uh well i mean it's a coupled event uh i am not an oceanographer but whatever my oceanographer friends say that there is more upwelling uh, sorry there is less upwelling in a negative iod phase when the eastern end is warmer much warmer generally the eastern end is much warmer than the uh, western end and when this upwelling i guess uh, reduces uh the sst is there get warmer and the western end the sst is get uh, weaker and then we have a negative iod so i think basically it's a coupled event which happens there and that could be really related to the fact that the winds might collapse and there could be less upwelling on the eastern side which could kind of increase the sst's and once sst's increase there will be more cloudiness and rainfall in that region which leads to a negative iot jyotiranjan ray from prl currently ncs director how does himalayas if at all affect the movement of itcz okay uh, okay we did some studies uh with and without himalayas of course this is a purely a thought experiment and we did find that uh, uh, himalayas tend to have kind of an anchoring effect on the rain bands that is if the rain band kind of moves it kind of culminates there but if the himalayas are not there it has a it could kind of move further northward so that anchoring effect or the obstructing effect that himalayas have and then there could be once it obstructs it kind of there could be a lot of ascent and lot of rainfall so that's how i think it's going to affect uh, it season and the extent of it season also we find is much larger and there is no where and there are no mountains to obstruct them ms narayanan from uh, earlier from space application center so he is asking which is better predictable the uh, the lf variability or the high frequency from the models ah oh, I, i don't know i mean frankly we have not done that study and i i, I don't know i mean I'd rather not I, i we have not looked at it that's all i will say it's a tough question to answer a good question but i have not studied that Nisha Bharti from uh, PRL. How do we distinguish the natural and the anthropogenic effect on monsoon? Uh, in observations, it's much more difficult because there is no easy way to separate it out. We can always talk of attributions, but in uh, model experiments, we can always do that. That is, we kind of switch off the anthropogenic effects and uh, look only at the natural variability. There are long runs from uh, a semen. which do only the natural variability where you look at only the volcanoes and other variability that comes into picture and then we also kind of look at uh, anthropogenic effects and based on it we can kind of distinguish that this is related to anthropogenic and this is related to natural and the fluctuations that we are seeing which i think ram has also studied and my colleague krishnan also has looked at anthropogenic effect if you just look at the global ghg is increase that should lead to an increase in monsoon but if you also include the effect of aerosols then the monsoon tend to kind of explain the recent reduction that we have seen so it could be related to the fact that these aerosols uh, so these aerosols have always natural aerosols have been there for immemorial but the anthropogenic uh, aerosols are now of recent things so the recent reduction that we are seeing could be related to the anthropogenic effect that is the aerosol effect so that's how i mean it's basically from modeling studies we can kind of uh, do it Uh, i mean it basically from models only we can do that it's very difficult from just pure observations to s- separate the effects are there any further questions from the audience okay um if not uh, ravi um i am really very thankful on behalf of prl for sparing your time and giving such an excellent colloquium um it was a pleasure meeting you talking to you and hearing you for for more than an hour so thank you thank you ram and thank you raju and thanks to prl for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you yeah it's been it's been a pleasure uh, to hear to you and and i think before we you know, uh, 
to conclude, I had uh, you know a couple of curious questions, if I may. Okay. Sure. And <laughs> that is uh, the 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 contrast that you talked about, you know, between Indian monsoon and the in the Western African the seesaw or the, or the anti-correlated behavior. <laughs> Do we see that kind of analogies in other longitudes as well, or it's or if not, what is so unique about this region? Uh, well, I mean, both are monsoonal regions, and uh, we did find that there could be a, a association, a changing nature of association between these two. We find, of course, there are monsoons in other regions of the world, but we have not really looked at the association. The other monsoons are not really this strong. If you look at the American monsoon, it is not this strong. Of course, the West Pacific is there, but then there are many players coming into it. For example, they have a large number of typhoons, and it's essentially an oceanic one. But if you uh, continental volcanic ITCZ, uh, uh, Af African monsoon and uh, Indian monsoon are similar, and both of them have an idea. I mean, El Nino has an effect on it. So we thought, okay, well, let us look at it, and whether, and then we know that okay, there is a changing effect, changing uh, signal that we are getting in Enso. And when we kind of looked at it, we found that they seem to have a seesaw. It is possible that others also can be having a seesaw, but we have not looked at it. And uh, okay, in the, in the other trends we have not seen LF and uh, you know HF uh, showing different uh, you know and the synoptic one. Uh, yeah. Is there any spatial variation in in the kind of correlations, or it's the whole Indian region that's taken together in that kind of? Thing? Uh, no, it's always. Uh, uh, we have looked at the, those patterns and how those patterns change over time. So there is, it's never that in, entire India is in the same phase. For when we have looked at the different phases, somewhere somewhere it is raining more, somewhere it is raining less. So and in different phases, the effects could be different. And as we found that the, the increase of extremes in the break phase has a bigger impact on the low, uh, low frequency ISO rather than in the other phase. Ravi, there are uh, two more questions. Um, one from one from Supriyo, uh, your neighborhood. So he is okay. asking the proxy data showed that the ISM was weak, and South American monsoon was strong during the Little Ice Age. Does this uh, kind of polarity exist in modern times? Okay, Supriyo. Again, a tough question. I have not looked at the South American monsoon. Uh, maybe I or somebody should look at it and then maybe I can answer. I don't know. I mean, I have not looked at the South American monsoon or its impact on ISM. So <coughs> perhaps there would be, if a proxy data shows it, then perhaps even now there could be a relationship. And of course, we know that both of them are affected by the Indian, uh, by El Nino, both the South America and Nordeste area of Brazil also has an, uh, it also is affected by ENSO. So I'm sure there is a, through the ENSO, there should be some relationship, but I have not looked at it. There is one question from Adil Hussain. Is there any way we can correlate ENSO, IOD and monsoon variability together? Um, a three, uh, okay, that is, I think a mathematician can answer it better than me. If there is a three variable co uh, way, correlation in a three, whatever space we want to look at, Perhaps there could be some mathematical technique which can kind of give a look at this association. But, but if you look at each of them separately, like when we do partial correlations, that will give you that. But uh, I mean, only between these two, two variables at a time. And uh, people have shown that some aspects of IOD are independent of ENSO, but some of them could, uh, some of the ENSO, IOD events could also be related to ENSO. So it's not that they're completely independent, but uh, there could be IOD independent of ENSO. But I'm not aware of any mathematical technique which kind of gives a three variable correlation, but uh, I'm not a mathematician. So maybe I, somebody can help me out with that question. Also. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. It was indeed a pleasure listening to you. Um, have a good evening and have a good week ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ram. Thank you, Professor Raju. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, no, it's. it's uh, before we end, I would also like to thank all the colleagues from IITM who have joined, and uh, uh, not just you know PRL colleagues, but also you know senior people who are watching from various parts of India and the world. I thank you all for for joining in this uh, 
week's colloquium and i will request uh, you know and invite you all to the next week's you know colloquium also which i'll try to which i'll let you know today <laughs> which is uh, by you know professor uh, randeria uh, he is from ohio state university and that say uh, he's going to <clears throat> he's going to uh, talk to us on are there you know upper bounds on the superconducting uh, transition temperature so this is another another uh, you know uh, talk which covers different aspects of uh, physics and uh, and that's a special colloquium we call it special because it's a different time because the speaker is joining us from the us so the yeah. time is now morning 10:30 a <clears throat> so thank you all once again for joining thank you professor nanjan daya for uh, taking time off uh, we had an excellent discussion and uh, you know it has been informative and insightful to all of us thank you very much and uh, take care thank you thanks again